All right. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I think we'll, we'll begin. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the tradi traditional owners and cust custodians of the land on which we are meeting and learning today. We respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this beautiful city and region. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. We would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's event. Talu falava everybody. My name is Eva Penese Yuli. I am the Multicultural Liaison Officer here at Healthcare Consumers Association. HCCA is the health consumer's voice to the ACT government and other health services. Just a bit of housekeeping, um, questions will be collected um, and have been collected from registrations, but if you have a question you can pop the, them in the chat as well, or we'll have a, a time for you to, to ask your questions at the end of the, of the talk. Um, this is as well recorded, so if you want to pop your camera off, that's okay. And if you can please stay on mute while um, we are doing our presentation. Uh, this is the second of our Dying to Know Day events, our second webinar. And I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Talu Falava, Dr. Rosalina Sa Saangapanuve. Uh, Dr. Rosalina is a research fellow at ANU at the National Center for Epidemiology and Population Health. She's working on the Pacific Evidence Informed Policies programs, and her work is based on health security and field epidemiology training. She may touch on the, um, those aspects of your work, of her work, but um, for today, she'll be sharing um, perspectives on death and dying from a Samoan and Fiji perspective. Um, over to you, Dr. Rosalina. Thank you very much, uh, Penny. And uh, again, I'd, uh, um, especially for the acknowledgement of our country and let me reiterate what a, a privilege it is for me as a uh, non-Indigenous Australian to have been availed the different opportunities that this country offers. And therefore, again, acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we work and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngangawal and Nambri people past and present. Now, as uh, Pene mentioned, I'm a Samoan medical practitioner. I trained in Tasmania and I worked here in Australia and mainly in Fiji as uh, a medical practitioner and mainly as a pediatrician and then moved into policy and management. And now I've been back here in Australia for a year now and um, continuing my um, focus throughout my career, which is really improving the capacity of mainly Pacific Island people in health. So our topic, death and dying, and obviously my career has been based on making people and especially children survive and thrive. However, death was always present and has uh, been a, a part of my work, like delivering bad news, ensuring comfort for the person dying. And then obviously as, um, an individual um, dealing with death of uh, relatives and friends, etc. And to clarify from the out outset, I'm not a scholar on culture and basically give this webinar through the way of uh, sharing a few stories about death from my own perspective, as Benny mentioned, as a Samoan girl growing up in Samoa then as a woman married to a Itauke Fijian man, living in Fiji for over 20 years. And just outlining some cultural, religious, and practical aspects of dying that we all have to deal with. So as we say in the Pacific, it's a little bit of a talanoa or just a storytelling. 
So my first story is really my first memory of death. And that was when I was at a young age of eight years old in the late 1960s in Samoa. My maternal grandfather was dying in hospital in Apia. And I recall going with my grandmother to look at coffins. And on our return to the hospital, my grandfather asked me, where have you been? What, have, what did you do? And then, you know, as I think a young person, you're always wanting to speak and tell stories. So I started to tell him. And I was about to tell him about the coffin, but found myself stopping myself when the realization was that the coffin was for him, but he hadn't died yet. So at that very young age, I think sometimes we forget that children can also feel nuances and experience death and that we shouldn't hide things from them. My grandfather was a paramount chief of his village and his subsequent funeral was full of um, ceremonial exchanges amongst the families. But what I remember most from that day in 1969 <clears throat> was how solemn the situation was. I remember the silence and the dignity that everyone observed during that time. Fast forward to the late to uh, early 2000s. I was then uh, a married woman and living and working in Fiji. My father-in-law had suffered a stroke in the late 90s, and he died in the early 2000s. We were living in Suva, and my father-in-law was originally from the other main island in Fiji. So one of the first things was delivering a very carefully worded message to his people in the village. And then the preparation started for his funeral, which included setting up a tent, making sure there was kava available all the time for the men, and then tea and sandwiches for the people who were visiting. So I witnessed the tr traditions and exchanges of the Samoan culture when my own parents died, albeit 30 years apart. So I've observed that close hand death from an eight year old as a 20 year old, and then there's a mature 50 year old woman. woman. And both the Samoan and Itauke Fijian cultures place family ties and connections as the mainstay in whatever occasions they mark, be it weddings, birthdays, and of course, funerals. Now for both cultures, there's a tradition of presentations and the orator or speaker during the presentations outlines the linkages between the deceased and the delegation. In a Samoan funeral, families come to pay respect and show their ties by what we call si'ialofa, which can be translated to a gift of love which is a presentation of fine mats, food, and money. The Itauke Fijian traditional presentation at a funeral is known as Na Iring Ring, which again includes presentation of a tambua or a whale's tooth, a bundle of yangona, which is kaba, mats, food, and money. Now both cultures also reciprocate. And the Samoans usually do this immediately after each presentation by returning back some of the mats and money together with food. A meal is also prepared during the times of presentations and after the funeral. The Itauke culture reciprocates by what is known as a burua, immediately after the funeral, which is sharing of food and mats from the funeral and by the provision of a meal for all those 
who attended the funeral. They then usually have a commemoration known as the fourth night, 10th night, 100th night, so bongi ba, bongi tini, and 100th nights. <clears throat> now throughout the rituals and rites of these cultural practices, religion and faith plays a huge role and runs through all the proceedings with prayers, singing and praising to provide comfort to the deceased families. And one of the most memorable aspects of both Samoan and Itau K Fijian funerals is the beautiful singing of hymns. On the practical side of things, the grieving family decide and plan funeral services and obviously deal with the emotional aspect of their grief. Most of us nowadays do checklists to make sure that we cover everything and also allocate tasks. I have only really given you a very simple, maybe too simplistic snapshot of what the Samoan and Itauke culture does and is faced with um, during a funeral. But I think it's also important to note that culture and practices change with time and by personal preferences by the families. An example of this is sometimes Samoan families in their announcement of the death can say the saying, Tao fi limalo, which basically means that they don't want any fine mats to be presented. A more recent practice in Samoa is a laying of a tombstone one year after the funeral service. And this has really just come about maybe in the last 20 years or so, because it wasn't um, a custom way back. Similarly, in the Itauke Fijian family, they may include in their death announcement that there will be no ring ring in accordance with his or her wishes of the person who died. Similarly, some families combine what I have mentioned, their fourth, 10th and 100th night celebration to do it all together directly after the funeral. In doing this webinar, I may have uh, glossed over the cultural things that uh, Samoan and Itauke and, and certainly other cultures go through during death and dying. But I think the mainstay in both the Samoan and Itauke Fijian cultures, which may be not dissimilar to most cultures, are three things. The first one is the affirmation of familial ties and kinship. The second is honoring and celebrating the life of the one that has left us. And the third is finding ways to sustain and maintain hope in those that are left behind. I think we're fortunate here in Australia that H, um, the Healthcare Consumers Association and various other government agencies are there to give support and assist with respect to the practical and especially legal aspects of death and dying. However, obviously the cultural aspects of it you will have to rely on your families and close friends in order to make the best from what you have grown up with and also in respect of the one that has died, but more importantly on um, what is doable and can be done 
now in our times and in our situations and living in this country. So I'd like to say and um, and I welcome any questions. Um, Rosa. Um, thank you so much for being so gracious with your time and for sharing those um, personal experiences to help us learn about what um, death and dying is in the Samoan and Fijian perspective. Um, if there's any questions, please let me know. You can put it in the chat. You can raise your hand um, with the emojis or raise your hand um, in person and we'll be able to collect those questions. Um, while we wait for those to come through, I did have one that came through our system and um, that was, what are the afterlife beliefs for Samoan and Pacific culture? And is there a belief that the spirit lives on? And if so, where does it go? Thank you, Penny. And um, it's hard to, to really say that there is a, uh, a set belief from my own personal perspective. And it, it really is majority of um, Pacific Islanders and uh, the Itoke are Christian. So it's really the, the Christian belief that um, the spirit does live on. And, um, you know, there's no, um, Certainly, I can't recall of um, somewhere where they say the spirit is. I think if we go into um, history, there's always, and, and we've heard, of, okay, this is where the death go, according to Samoan culture. And I've heard those sayings. But now, you know, in, these, uh, in this day and age, uh, a lot of it is really tied in with our religious and um, our spiritual faith. Thank you. Thank you for that. And if um, if I can add, I think um, I've had parents pass as well, and you, you know you can refer to them as their spirit is always around you, um, and you know sort of helping um, my own children in in understanding and knowing where they are. Um, and another practice is of we bury our dead within our family land, and so we always know when we go home we can go and sit. Um, at the grave and, and, and we think that their spirit is there, but also everywhere. Um, we've got another question come through. Is it acceptable in Samoan culture to talk about death or is that something people don't do? I like that um, question. And um, I think it really comes down to personal choices and things and um, a lot of um, you know you you can't um, generalize and say this is that because I might be saying it from my own uh, family perspective but it might not um, be the same for all families but death is certainly acceptable I think if we want to put it it's a certainty that all of us uh, will um, die. And, and it can be um, certainly talked about. And in some families, like if you know that a person is dying, like the conversation is held and you ask them what are their wishes and how they'd like their, their funeral to be conducted. But then it really will be down to what, how that person takes things and uh, how, how they um, accept it. So that's from me as a Samoan and, you know, going through and Benny may be able to add. From my experience in my uh, Itauke Fijian family, it really, that it's not discussed. So whilst our preparations might be happening in the background, but um, it's not as um, openly discussed as it would be in my uh, Samoan culture. Thank you. 
Bendy? Mm. Yeah, I certainly support mm. that. And and I think once 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 a person has passed on and we start the preparations, it then is, you know, it is acceptable. And I'm just remembering um, you know, if if a high chief is is passing on and their wishes on who can take that um, the title when they are then when they've passed on, that's something that that also comes into mind. So they're passing on on the, on those wishes to the next generation that are coming through. Um, yeah. So thank you, thank you for that. If there's um, any other questions, I've got another one from our um, registration, and this is just. Um, what are the most difficult choices for Samoans and for Pacific peoples um, when a loved one passes here in Australia? And I think this might be meaning in terms of um, the protocols in Australia and how different they are. They would be at home. Thank you, Ben. And um, so obviously you have on one hand, all the legal and practical aspects of uh, death and dying and all the paperwork and everything that must be uh, satisfied. And I think as Penny mentioned, most of our funerals in, in both Samoa and in the Pacific are conducted in the home where the body is brought home. And uh, then all of those presentations are usually done around the home. So obviously that might be um, an aspect that uh, must be is, is trying to respect and honor the traditions, but also making sure that you're in compliance with all of uh, the law and, and legal implications. Um, I know for a fact that um, a body can be kept at home here in Australia because that happened to uh, an uncle and aunt of mine who both died in Geelong. But obviously all the right permissions have to be obtained. Then the other aspect is really how much of your culture and traditions that um, you observe and um, what do you do and, and all that. And, and then it, it really then comes down to personal choice and uh, in agreement with uh, all of your family, obviously the immediate family, but then uh, like it is for us, it's not just the immediate family, it's the extended family, which uh, includes all the different, um, as Ben mentioned, chiefly titles or people from that same, uh, um, village or clan, etc. So, whilst uh, and that's one of uh, the main things is, is that um, whilst you're trying to deal with your grief, you also have to deal with all those other practical aspects. So, I think one of the main difficulties is um, knowing what, how much, or how little to. Um, do with the observation of your culture and tradition. But at the end of the day, I think it's, um, as I've mentioned, if, uh, if you focus on honoring and celebration of the life that has left us and uh, finding ways that uh, to sustain and maintain hope, but at the same time, acknowledging our genealogy and our culture. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if there's any other questions? No? All right. Well, I just would like to again say Faftai Tedelava, Dr. Rosalina, for um, articulating such, you know, um, sort of <clears throat> difficult issues and presenting them in a way that we hope to, to gain a perspective into um, the Samoan and Fijian culture. Um, and